Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Ember's European Electricity Review 2024. Thank you for joining wherever you are in the world. My name is Kira Taylor. I'm an energy and climate journalist based in Brussels, and I'll be chairing the discussion today as we hear what progress the EU has made towards a clean power system. Over the next hour, we'll hear from some of the people who put together the report. We'll then move on to a panel discussion with expert speakers looking at Europe's momentum towards a clean energy system. At the end of this, there will be time for you to ask your questions both to the panel and to the people presenting the report. Please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will try and get through as many as possible. If you are asking them to a particular person, just note that as well and I will send them to the right person. This event is being recorded, so if you want to watch it back or share it, you can find it on Ember's website. You can also find the full report there, just go to ember-climate.org. We also invite you to post about the report on social media using the hashtag EER24. Well, you don't want to hear it from me about the report, you want to hear it from the people who put it together. So to start off our event, we're going to dive into the contents of that report. The 2020 review is the eighth of its kind and contains some record-breaking news about the energy mix powering Europe. To talk us through that, I'd like to pass over to our end of speakers. We have Sarah Brown, Europe Program Director, Dave Jones, Global Insights Program Director, and Matt Ewan, Data Analyst. So to tell us more, Sarah, you have the floor. Actually, Dave's gonna go first. Thanks, Kira. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming along today um, uh, for the launch. Hopefully it's the most engaging and thoughtful um, uh, report uh, yet of the, 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 the eight that we've done so far. Um, there's four key findings that we want to run through with you. Um, so if you just skip forward, thank you. Um, I get the pleasure of describing the record fossil fuel collapse last year and then show why that after two years of falling electricity demand, we're about to enter a new era of electricity demand growth. Then I'll pass over to Sarah to show the role of wind and solar and why system flexibility is now key to Europe's electricity transition. And then Matt will finish up to say a little bit more about the electricity data um, that powers this report. So to start a little bit uh, of a celebration, I guess, at the record fossil fuel collapse of 2023, 2023 showed a shift to clean power in action, uh, unveiling the full extent of Europe's electricity transition. Um, on the next slide, uh, you can see coal power generation in the EU fell to a, by a record 26% in 2023. As a result, coal dropped to the lowest level ever, more than raising the upticks during the last two years. Um, and coal generation now in the EU is now just half the level of what it was in 2016 and just 12% of EU's electricity last year came from coal. Gas generation fell by a record 15% as well, and that's the fourth year in a row that gas generation has now declined. Some of the biggest falls historically are when uh, coal is switching into gas or gas into coal, so it's unusual to see both uh, big falls for both falls, uh, fuels simultaneously. And for that reason, the falls in power sector emissions were unprecedented, falling by 19%. 11 EU countries set records for the size of the power sector emission falls, including Spain's, which fell by 25%, and Germany's power sector emissions, which fell by 21%. When we launched last year's report 12 months ago, um, uh, if you uh, um, skip forward a slide, please, um, we predicted this fall for 2023, so it wasn't a surprise in itself. And it was important at the time to highlight that that rise in coal and emissions that we saw in 2022 were going to be temporary and that Europe's electricity transition would look very different in 2023. And that it did. Uh, hydro generation increased, rebounding after the one in 500 year droughts in 2022 that swept across mainland Europe. Wind and solar generation set new records. Electricity demand continued to fall. And those combined led to a record fossil fuel um, uh, uh, collapse. And 
In the next slide, if we, when we look at what that ha happened from that big fall in coal generation, it was not due to coal power plant closures. In fact, in the, in the last two years to 2023, just 4% of the EU's coal capacity closed. The closures of many of the coal power plants were postponed and a small portion of units actually came back into operation as part of emergency reserves. But that is about to change. 20% or a fifth of the EU's coal fleet will close over the next two years. This includes 10 gigawatts in Germany, much of which is scheduled to shut down in April this year. And next year, a large number of coal plants will close in Italy, in Poland and in Greece. And this will ensure coal generation continue to fall and that the EU's coal phase out continues apace. Next slide, please. And gas generation will be next. Here's the electricity mix for Italy, Spain and Netherlands. Uh, together, these country, three countries accounted for half of the EU's gas generation. And now that coal is mostly already phased out in these three countries, as wind and solar uh, continues to get built, it will start to displace gas generation. And gas power plants will run for fewer and fewer hours, turning more into a backup role during the hours of low sun and low wind. There have already been four years in a row of falling EU gas generation, and that's just the start. So now I just want to share some of my analysis that explains why electricity demand has fallen so far and why from 2024, we'll enter a new era uh, of demand growth. Next slide, please. EU electricity demand fell by over 6% from 2021 to 2023. And although this seems large, it's worth noting that that fall in gas demand was three times as big as the fall in electricity demand. Gas demand has been far more impacted through the, the energy crisis than, than electricity demand has been. Just over a third um, of this fall can be attributed to a fall in industrial production, 80% of which came from just three industrial sectors. They were iron and steel, chemicals and petrochemicals, and paper and pulp. Weather was also a significant factor, with 2023 being exceptionally mild and the second warmest year on record for Europe. And that was offset um, by that tranche in blue on the graph, um, which was uh, uh, electrification, which added well over 1% to EU electricity demand. And since the energy crisis began, 3 million heat pumps and 3 million electric cars have been sold in the EU. And the energy crisis has served uh, to vastly accelerate that shift towards electrification. The residual amount is predominantly, primarily um, from savings and efficiency, and whether or not these reductions are sustainable um, remains to be seen. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the final slide for, for me to end on. I just want to show how those falls in electricity demand are now over. The latest monthly data indicates that the decline in electricity demand has now stabilized. Industrial production is growing once again. Electricity prices are their lowest in over two and a half years. And we estimate that 2024 could see a modest rebound of electricity demand of around about two to 3%, making up about half of the fall that we've seen in demand since 2021. And that will be just the start. Accelerating electrification will put us in a new era of rising electricity demand. The draft NECPs and the National Energy Climate Plans give some glimpses into what is expected. For example, Italy sees that electricity demand will rise by 13% by 2030 and Spain by 17%. More and more of the wind turbines and solar panels we build will not be to reduce coal and gas generation, but to replace uh, use of oil in our cars and gas in our heating and will be key to unlocking big emissions reductions across the whole economy. Thank you, and I'll uh, pass over to Sarah now, please. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dave. And as Dave mentioned, I'm now going to talk a bit more about the wind and solar role in this shift, and also a little bit about system flexibility. Um, next slide, please. So renewables achieved over 40% share of electricity for the first time in 2023 to reach 44%. And from this chart, you can see that wind and solar drove this more than all other renewables. In fact, 2023 was another record year for wind and solar with combined year on year increases in generation of 90 terawatt hours and installed capacity of 73 gigawatts. 
All in all, they accounted for 27% of the EU electricity mix, which was also a record. 24 countries achieved a record share of solar, with Greece emerging as the new leader with 19% share, and 25 countries installed more solar capacity year on year. For wind, 21 countries achieved a rec um, achieved highest ever share of wind as well. And Denmark is lead, still leading with wind making up 58%, but both Germany and Netherlands saw strong growth. And this push in renewables and wind and solar drove clean power to over two thirds of EU electricity in 2023. And um, from the next slide, so this is great news for wind and solar and this growth is excellent. But we can see from the left-hand chart that solar failed to reach the same um, levels of increase in generation as 2022. We believe, however, that this is partly due to some system operators struggling to accurately measure behind the meter solar generation. We talk a little bit more about that in the report. So growth rates of both wind and solar, while great for 2023, need to be accelerating to hit the Repower EU generation targets. Especially, we need to see an increase in wind annual installed capacity. On the next slide, we do actually focus in on wind. We see actually some exciting news. It saw its highest ever year-on-year -year increase with 17 gigawatts installed and an increase in annual generation of 55 terawatt hours, so 13%. Wind generation was 475 terawatt hours, um, France's, uh, the same as France's total demand, versus 452 terawatt hours from gas. So there it was, it overtook gas for the first time. It accounted for 18% share of electricity versus 17% for gas. And 2023 also saw the first year, aside from COVID impact of 2020, that wind generation was also higher than coal. Next slide, please. I'm now going to speak a little bit more about system flexibility. So on this next slide, we, we found in our analysis that the EU is moving away from reliance on fossil plants for system flexibility. In 2023, 24% of ours saw less than a quarter of electricity coming from fossil fuels. And this is up substantially from just 4% of ours in 2022. We also saw numerous examples of EU power systems running for more hours purely on renewables. Portugal ran entirely on renewables for six consecutive days in November. Germany saw six days in December when all of its demand was covered by renewables. And in the Netherlands, June saw 140 hours in which electricity produced from wind and solar alone exceeded the total electricity demand. Next slide, please. We also saw in 2023 that attention really turned to the key enablers of a clean power system, such as grids, storage and demand side flexibility. The enhanced flexibility that storage provides is one of the ways to reduce incidents of price cannibalization, cannibalization, negative prices and curtailment, which were also um, more in the spotlight last year. On this chart, we're looking at the seasonal um, uh, requirements for flexibility. There is variability associated with wind and solar power generation, which does require hourly and daily balancing through storage or peaking power plants. However, we found that persistent claims about wind and solar creating a need for seasonal storage may well be exaggerated. This chart shows how wind and solar have complemented each other, reducing the, that need for the seasonal storage. Next slide, please. So to conclude, we've seen in 2023, the EU's clean transition took significant strides forward. The structural shift away from fossil fuels to renewables continued, and as Dave said, got a fifth of coal power plants closing by 2025. And we also saw that dramatic drop in gas. But a step up in wind, solar and flexibility is now key, and we need to see that happening rapidly 
and particularly this year. I'm now going to hand over to Matt, who's going to tell us a little bit about the data that goes into this report. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much, Sarah. So we collect data on electricity generation, net imports and demand uh, from about 15 sources to give the most accurate picture we can of the EU generation mix in 2023. Um, we provide this data both uh, for monthly generation and for yearly generation since 1990. Um, and there's a full methodology available in the report if you're interested, or you can reach out to us at the data team or to me, my email will be on a couple of slides. Um, with the report, we are providing release files for this yearly and monthly generation data for all countries, plus an EU aggregate containing both generation imports demand and also emissions. You can again download, the, download these from the report page. Going beyond the EU, we provide a similar data set for the world at large. So we collect yearly data for 216 countries and economic uh, regions um, and monthly data for, I think, 80 at present. Um, we, uh, we also aggregate this into a number of regions and economic aggregates. And we update this data set twice a month to make sure that we have the most up-to-date and accurate picture of global generation as possible. You can access this via our data explorer, which I'm showing on the screen right now, or you can download it directly from our data catalog. And again, please feel free to reach out if you want to know anything about how this comes together. Thanks so much. And I'll hand back to Kira. Thank you, Matt. Some really interesting findings from all of that. And if that's got you intrigued about the report, you can find the whole thing on Ember's website. But don't go looking for it just yet, as we now have our panel discussion to take a closer look at Europe's momentum towards a clean energy system. So to discuss this, we have Marta Anksuska, uh, Energy Policy Coordinator at Climate Action Network Europe. She works on the decarbonisation of Europe's power sector, including the just transition in coal dependent regions. Giovanni Scavati, Energy and Climate Research Analyst at Bruegel, his work spans from productivity to energy and climate change. Naomi Chevalard, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Solar Power Europe. She coordinates regulatory analysis and the association's position on policy. And finally, Jacopo Tassini, Executive Manager and Head of Policy at the European Association for the Storage of Energy. He supports the association's advocacy efforts, looking particularly at electricity market design. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I'd like to start with a quick question for all of you. So in a couple of sentences, what are your thoughts on EU's, pro on EU's progress in its clean energy transition? And what is now needed perhaps to maintain that momentum? Marta, let's start with you. What's your view on this? Thank you, Kira. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. First of all, I think it's uh, great news to see this record for all coal and gas generation, and obviously also the reduction of the emission from the power sector. We needed uh, such a hopeful information uh, after so many turbulent years. Um, I think that confirms that EU has set the right objectives, how to navigate the, the consecutive crisis. But still, as an NGO, we feel that there is more ambition needed on renewables um, to get uh, to to be to get on the 1.5 trajectory. So, despite this great news, uh, still the higher ambition on the renewables uh, is needed versus the recently adopted target. And also, my reflection is that now the key will be uh, that member states really revise their NECPs because for how it was also indicated uh, in the report that uh, many of them are not matching the, the newly adopted target. And uh, given what we saw on the data and how the renewables can actually move us forward combined with the flexibility, maybe some member states could even uh, overshoot this ambition. So um, I think the focusing on, on them will be the key now and uh, we'll see how this uh, process develops. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Giovanni, I'd like to come to you next. What are your thoughts on the EU's progress towards clean energy and what is needed now to maintain that? Yeah, thank you, Kira. Um, I agree very much with uh, what Marta has just said. And I think this report is really a report of, of hope uh, that is not all doom and gloom, but uh, change is actually possible. And the transition is, uh, in fact, uh, taking up speed, at least uh, in, in the power sector. Um, and this, uh, for me, proves that the ETS uh, is working, 
And uh, the EU has really done a fantastic job, in my opinion, to preserve the ETS uh, and also to launch uh, um, the works on the ETS2 during uh, the energy crisis, which was not uh, to be given for, for granted. Um, and uh, however, to post uh, the change also in other sectors, uh, which will be other sector to decarbonize, um, in my opinion, uh, the EU should uh, really progressively bring all emissions uh, under the uh, ETS um, and consistently uh, put a carbon price uh, on emissions. Then uh, it should also launch preparations for an EU green investment plan, especially as the uh, RRF, uh, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, is phased out, and therefore that uh, source of funding will decrease dramatically. Um, another idea for me would be to establish a European energy agency. Um, because the, the fantastic work that Amber does, uh, you know, on data collection, data uh, gathering, and visualization uh, and fusion um, should uh, should be even uh, more uh, and institutionalized uh, if possible. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'll conclude uh, uh, with saying that another another idea would be to really bring uh, energy and climate to ads uh, of state, uh, like it's done uh, for finance, for example, with uh, the Euro Thank you. Thank you. Naomi, let's come to your, you next. What are your thoughts on the EU's progress in its clean transition and, and what is needed next? Thanks. So, I mean, I think the, the report is a uh, real good news. Uh, it really shows that renewables are there to be the the basis of the of the electricity system and can support Europe's energy security by replacing coal and gas. I don't think we could have imagined that a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's a, it's a really an excellent news. Um, I think now our eyes uh, should be towards two questions. One is how can we make the power system uh, work to deliver cheap and reliable electricity to consumers, so that means investing into grids, investing into clean flexibility, uh, as, as was shown by Sarah. And the second is how to bring this uh, cheap and reliable power supply to consumer by further uh, electrifying. And that's where uh, uh, in the future, we, we do think that uh, having an electrification target will be, uh, will be so important. Thank you. And last but not least, Jacopo, let's come to you on this. What are your thoughts on the EU's progress on its clean energy transition and what's needed next? Thanks, Kira. It's always tough to speak for last because I think a lot of very good points have already been raised. But I fully agree that the EU is on the right path. Europe's vision is, is the right one. I think we have a much better understanding of what's uh, the role of renewables and energy storage. Policymakers understand it. Indeed, at the member state level, that's that's really where we have challenges. And so I think to maintain momentum, we need to ensure that the political support that de facto has really pushed forward um, renewables and energy storage in the past two, three years, especially, is there both at the EU and at the member state level. Thank you. I'd like to maybe dive into some deeper topics now. Marta, let's come to you next. Coal generation fell by a record 26% in 2023. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has not led to more coal usage and a fifth of EU coal capacity, as we've seen, is now expected to close in the next two years. Which policies do you see led to this decline and what lessons can the EU learn as it now turns to looking at phasing out gas? Well, I think it was already mentioned by uh, Giovanni that it's actually ETS doing its work. So um, if uh, there is one policy uh, that should be mentioned uh, in this uh, transition, it's, it's definitely ETS. And uh, also falling cost of renewable uh, power. So uh, we see the curves. We knew this will happen. So that's also not a, a shocking news, but it's good that it's working together well. Um, I think for the lessons learned um, uh, for the gas sector, it's a little bit tricky because there are some experiences that can be taken over like anticipatory planning that can actually really lower down the decommissioning cost because the sooner you plan what will happen with this um, infrastructure, 
uh, which is uh, becoming obsolete, the better you can spend money and the less cost is socialized. But the, these are very different infrastructures. So when we look at what happens when the coal power plant is shutting down and the, uh, how the recultivation or rehabilitation plays out, this is very different for the, for the gas sector because part of this infrastructure can be actually repurposed. A uh, part of it needs to be decommissioned, a uh, large part of it. And I think uh, we are not there yet. So the policymakers haven't started uh, to, to face the challenge of planning the, the gas decommissioning infrastructure. So the one lesson we can draw from the coal phase out towards the gas phase out is the earlier you plan, uh, the less you spend and the more social, socially acceptable the process can be. And when we speak about social acceptance, let me maybe jump back to coal again for a minute, uh, because despite this amazing fall uh, in, in, and the, the really good trends uh, for the coal phase out, there are still several countries which are facing challenges. And there, uh, not only ETS, but some, some more push, some more commitment from the politicians is needed. I'm, I'm especially thinking about Poland, Bulgaria, Czechia, and also we saw some some um, strange developments in Hungary. So um, here I would like to maybe underline that uh, ambition is needed, uh, good planning is needed, uh, good NECP is needed, and a just transition fund, which also played a role in accelerating the coal phase out, needs to be continued because this fund has been operating for two years only, the spending has only started. So it, it is really imperative that in, under new uh, MFF, there is a continuation of this support. Thank you. I think it's really key to emphasize the planning aspect here, but also the socially acceptability of this. I can see some questions coming in on the Q&A, but keep them coming in as we'll have time for questions later. Giovanni, I'd like to come to you next. So in 2023, EU electricity demand was 6.4% lower than in 2021. A third of this decline was caused by a drop in industrial electricity consumption. Although Ember's data shows that demand trend reversed in October, it doesn't seem to be positive news that we're hearing from Europe's industry lately. What measures could help increase the renewables rollout and speed up electrification in order to help Europe's industry become more competitive? Yeah, so as Dave said before, um, it's uh, mostly around 80% uh, this uh, uh, drop uh, in industrial demand for electricity comes really from uh, energy intensive sectors such as chemicals, uh, um, steel uh, and uh, paper. And um, these sectors are also heavy gas consumers. Um, so it's possible that the fall uh, in production was uh, more a consequence of really high gas prices than, than higher electricity prices. Um, and uh, this uh, brings me to, to the second point, uh, because uh, um, nowadays uh, natural gas uh, is uh, really the, the marginal price setter for electricity in uh, uh, the, the vast uh, amount of, of hours uh, um, in, in some countries like mine in Italy is up to 90% of, of the hours where natural gas sets the price in for, for electricity. Um, so there is a need to uh, decouple uh, uh, electricity price from, from gas price uh, going forward. And this can be done with uh, further deployment of renewables, uh, with uh, uh, interconnectors uh, across uh, the EU, with more storage, uh, and all the things that, that we know and uh, that are well laid down in the report. And I think on the planning, um, I agree with, uh, with Marta, and also here, uh, probably an independent European network system operator with uh, a stronger mandate uh, than ANSOE or ACER uh, would, uh, would help a lot to uh, pinpoint what are the uh, important projects to go ahead with uh, and to ensure uh, that the existing cross-border transmission is op optimally used uh, to, to foster flexibility also in the distributional side. Um, then another point, if I have uh, another few seconds, is that uh, you should really 
adopt the revision of the energy taxation directive, which has been kind of shelved uh, at the moment, is all frozen. Um, but that, of course, uh, uh, is, is problematic because in some instances, in some countries, we've seen the price uh, of natural gas being, being lower than, uh, than electricity and also being taxed less than, than electricity. Um, and uh, and that's that's an issue. Uh, and similarly, uh, also in uh, in NECPs, uh, member states should really set down clear deadlines on the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies, which are still prevalent uh, uh, today. Um, yeah, and I stop here. Thank you. I think it's really important to raise the energy taxation directive, particularly as we hear that the Green Deal has pretty much been done. There are some elements that have possibly been left to one side. Naomi, let's come to you next. Solar continued its strong growth in 2023 with record generation and more capacity being added, but it's also facing new challenges and it must rapidly increase to meet Europe's targets for it. What do you see as those biggest challenges in the EU and what solutions are needed to increase the speed of that year on year growth? Yeah, so I mean, first you said it yourself. Uh, I just want to come back on the indeed the impressive growth of, uh, of solar. So 50 gigawatt this year, last year, sorry, compared to a bit less than 40 last year. So it's uh, it's really impressive. You have to imagine that for an industry, it's uh, it's it's massive, the growth that we're, we're acknowledging. It also translates into higher generation, as you said, uh, uh, 30, uh, 36 terawatt hour that were reported. We actually think it, uh, it is more than that, uh, simply for the reason that uh, the new solar generation that's added is a rooftop solar generation. Um, I have the figures somewhere, uh, 37 gigawatt of rooftop solar compared to 19 gigawatt on utility scale. And it's generation that's often behind the meter, not well understood by TSOs, not well, not well metered. Uh, and that's uh, structurally a problem in the solar industry that the prosumers, the rooftop PV is not well uh, recognized by a grid operator. And, and it would be great that uh, this changes because it's a huge flexibility potential. When it comes to challenges, the real barrier is for us the grid uh, and the grid infrastructure. And it's both before you connect, getting the information that you need to dimension your project, uh, going through the procedure without too much delay, and of course, getting the infrastructure to connect uh, your project. But when you're connected, you might as well uh, face negative prices or curtailment that affect your business case. Uh, so we urgently need to work on our, our grids and it's really an all hands on deck situation. We need to invest into infrastructure, but we need to also look for all the synergies that we could, all the, the good solutions that we can find, uh, including with flexibility to improve the, the situation. Um, there, uh, the solar industry is in, innovating uh, a lot. Uh, we have a lot of projects with, uh, with uh, storage, for example, with wind, we're working a lot on that. So we should also trust the industry to, to innovate and, and deliver. I also want to react to what Marta said. I think uh, gas infrastructure, infrastructure planning will be equally as important as power infrastructure planning for, for hydrogen. Um, and yeah, then, then we're working on, on other things. Uh, what, one thing that will be critical is revenue certainty for energy generation, because don't forget that we're a construction industry that has to make massive investments uh, that you pay back over 20 years. So uh, getting stable revenue prices, stable market design is important, uh, especially in the discussion that uh, Giovanni, you raised on, on the market design. Accessing land and accessing skills uh, is, is, of course, uh, critical. But uh, I can't conclude without saying that, uh, of course, one, one challenge would be also to find a sustainable solution for our supply chain. Um, you know that on Monday we, we've discussed some, uh, I mean, the Commission discussed some uh, possible trade measures on, on solar supply chain. While at the same time, the, the current situation is that we're very dependent and at all level of the manufacturing supply chain on China, and we don't see the, the, the plan to, uh, to transition away from, from that uh, situation. Thank you. I think a lot of really important uh, points. I mean, you can't go to an event in Brussels about energy at the moment without hearing the word grid. So a lot of work for Europe ahead. 
Jacopo finally, the report found that storage has benefits not only for system security and balancing, but it also improves the business case for solar through higher capture prices. But storage is not fully supported in all EU countries. What do you see is needed to increase the adoption of storage and build favorable market conditions for it? Yeah, um, I'm going to start my answer from um, the last thing I said. I mentioned political support. I didn't mention it for just because we like politicians. I mentioned it because uh, political support usually is a big driver of investments and it's, it's, uh, it's a way to attract capitals to Europe. But to go further into the details and thinking about the business case, again, what we said before, the lack of proper legal framework, uh, the clean energy package, the market design, we really need to implement it, uh, implement them as fast as possible. I think we see in several uh, EU countries very restrictive requirements for providing grid services. Oftentimes, services are not tendered out. So we need to develop these new market products to correctly value the, the energy storage contribution to the grid in terms of flexibility. And also, of course, ensure a level playing field between an energy storage and and other uh, fossil-based flexibility solution. The business case, I think, is still in there by legislation that is not really tailored to energy storage. So, for example, I'm thinking of the issue of double taxation or double grid fees, and this has a huge impact on the economics and really push developers and investors away. Uh, you said grid is a big thing. I do fully agree with you. Uh, congestion, I think it's it's something that maybe we're not always discussing enough. We really need to find ways to to solve congestion, maybe through local markets, so to 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 have market based solution to that. Um, and maybe finally, we need to make sure that there's really legal clarity regarding who does what. Um, that's the best way to attract new entrants. And so that the electricity market can really benefit from, from competition and from new solution and so on and so forth. Thank you. Well, I think we've heard a bit of a to-do list for Brussels and for EU countries from all of our panelists, when it, whether we're talking about grids or planning or all important social acceptability of everything that we're doing. Just while we have our panelists here, I'd like to ask them to give their maybe final reflections or, or their key point that they want to get across to everyone today. After this, we have time for questions from the audience, whether you want to ask those to our panel or to the speakers who introduced the Ember report earlier. So please do put them in the Q&A box. But first of all, um, Marta, now let's come to you. What do you see as the key takeaways from this discussion or the, the key point you want to tell people? Uh, thank you, Kira. Uh, I think the key takeaway is that many elements of the puzzle need to come together now at the right time. So there is uh, so much effort needed, for example, on planning of flexibility. Uh, we just saw new provisions being introduced under revised uh, electricity market uh, regulation that will set the framework, uh, but this will happen only in a year time. The, in a year time, there will be EU-wide methodology of how to assess the system flexibility needs in the member states. While we already know this is an issue. So big question mark is how to ensure that all these puzzles are meeting uh, at the right moment. And I think that that's a big challenge for the new commission. Also adding the elements of the grid um, reinforcement, especially on the distribution level, which is not that visible to EU policymakers and really depends on the member states. So I think on a very high level, my key takeout is that the cooperation will be key now for the next couple of years. Uh, between the member state level and uh, EU level, but also uh, within commission bodies and agencies to, to make sure we 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 hit the right uh, targets. I would like to also comment on two specific topics just to, relating to what was said. Uh, I really like the point Naomi, Naomi has made about how to bring clean and cheap power to consumers. I think that there's also one element that we are missing, which is awareness building uh, among citizens what is demand side flexibility and why this is important. Not only we need to equip them properly in uh, technological solutions like smart meters, but also newer um, appliances that can be programmed, but also we need to really uh, build awareness so they are happy and eager to be on board and become active consumers. Otherwise, uh, this won't happen. And while doing this, I think there's a 
great a big justice element or equity however you want to call it there and this will be a responsibility of the operators to build offers and uh, conditions or so for the low income households to participate thank you thank you giovanni what's your view on this what's your final takeaway uh, <clears throat> again totally agree with uh, what Martha said and uh, for me a key takeaway is that setting the right uh, regulatory framework uh, and uh, public support is fundamental uh, for this transition. Uh, we are having uh, the tangible uh, proof of that uh, uh, right now and we're seeing that in the power sector. So ambition should be kept high also and especially at the member state uh, level also going forward. And um, I think uh, this is really a prerequisite uh, uh, for, for the, the net zero. Thank you. Naomi, coming to you next, after everything we've heard today, what's, what's your key reflection? Well, I think there will still be more challenging on the way uh, to, to reaching more and more uh, renewable penetration in the grid. But I think we can also trust in clean technologies innovation. I mean, with a rooftop PV and a heat pump, you can store electricity over a couple of days. With a big solar and storage system, you can provide flexibility faster and cheaper than a gas uh, turbine. And with an agri-solar system, you can uh, reduce water evaporation on crops and help farmers uh, uh, adapt to, uh, to climate change. So it's important to uh, keep working and also trusting uh, innovation. Uh, where we, I mean, what we need is then, as you said, like the, the, the regulatory framework to, uh, to follow, uh, to provide the right conditions, as I said, for, uh, for renewable investors to, uh, to keep innovating and to keep uh, investing. And, uh, and, and I said, I think the infrastructure planning will also be uh, critical in that regard. Thank you. And finally, Jokipo, what's your take on this? I'd say my main takeaway is that there is optimism, uh, both among you know, the industry, but also uh, all the stakeholders. And I think this this optimism is quite justified. We've we've discussed quite a few challenges. I think all of us have have still some concerns, but all in all, we we still gonna see a rapid and uh, dramatic deployment of renewables and uh, and energy storage. Um, so I think we're going in the right direction, and we're really gonna see a lot of changes throughout Europe. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. I'd like you to ask you to stick around in case we have any questions from the audience for you. We've got about 15 minutes to dig into the questions that we've been sent in. I'll start with a question from Sebastian Goodenau. Uh, probably to Dave, if you're still around somewhere, can we expect electricity prices to be stable in 2024 or are we expecting them to increase again? Yeah, some great questions here to go through. Um, uh, thank you for them all. Um, uh, I think that the situation in 2024 is uh, um, is more and more comfortable um, from a, from a gas supply perspective. Storage levels are some of the highest they've been uh, ever for this time of year. Still, um, for um, the carbon price is interesting um, in how much it's come down um, um, and and how that will uh, evolve through this year. Um, but fundamentally, the supply side of, of, of electricity in, in Europe with uh, French reactors um, being so much better with the additional wind and solar coming on, um, is, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's reducing the chances for any kind of price spikes for, for, for this year. And the situation is looking quite comfortable. I guess that maybe the thing to highlight is, is that during last year, there was a record number of negative prices. And actually some of that flexibility and some of the issues around electricity prices as we go through this year, um, potentially are more on the downside than they are on the upside. And, and that flexibility that we're talking about and searching is as much about how you how you deal with the excess electricity hitting the grid when it's um, sunny or windy, and especially when it is sunny and windy. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that? If not, I have another question. Okay, I've got silence. So uh, a question from Rolf Wurston Hager. Hagen, apologies. Do you see an increasing demand for seasonal storage? Jakob, maybe let's come to you with this. 
So do you see an increasing demand for seasonal storage? And to what extent will diversi diversification between soda and wind alleviate the seasonal imbalance? Yakpo, let's start with you and maybe we can go to Ember afterwards. Sure, I, I think I can cover um, especially the first part. Um, so generally speaking, uh, we will see an increased demand for energy storage uh, solutions in general. I think we're forecasting as, as ease. Um, it times the cumulative install capacity in, in 2030 compared to, to 2022, 2023. Uh, part of that increase will be uh, related to longer duration energy storage. But to be specific regarding seasonal one, I think it's really the time frame uh, where we we do not really have a good market product that is able to valorize the 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 energy storage contribution to the grid. So it's probably gonna be uh, the, the slowest to 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 deploy uh, because the facto uh, daily or inter daily daily and, and seasonal solution have a few more revenue streams to tap in. Thank you. Does one of our Ember speakers want to come in on this so about uh, increasing demand for seasonal storage and what extent will divers diversification between solar and wind alleviate the solar imbal uh, seasonal imbalances? Um, I'll jump in and maybe Sarah wants to uh, and may, may have something to add or not. Um, but the um, Sarah had a great chart in her presentation, which showed just how much uh, um, on, a, on a monthly total basis, wind and solar offset each other through the year, um, which is quite reassuring. So when we talk about seasonal storage, there's maybe that's not that like it's it uh, maybe that's not the the, the biggest focus. Um, there's two other types of storage. There's the within day storage and especially around solar, um, and that is being filled by um, by lithium, which you, the batteries which are able to quite um, quite well cope with kind of three hours, three four hours um, shift across the day, which are quite useful. And um, and just that step up in production and the step and the, and the the fall in prices in in lithium battery we've seen in twelve months is absolutely unprecedented. Um, so there's definitely a big revolution coming about how quickly those lithium batteries will will be rolled out. Um, um, and then there's a, a kind of third and final bit on energy store on on electricity storage, which is the the the, the days and weeks storage, and that it, that is a bit of a concern when the wind comes across in winter. It quite often comes across with um, in patterns over um, uh, over a week or two. So that's definitely something that that would need to be addressed through through storage more so than seasonal storage by itself. Sarah, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I was just going to add as well, we're talking about, if we're talking about broadest um, wind and solar complementing each other, it's also that um, the EU interconnection is key as well. So where you've got maybe in the sunnier parts where the solar is built and the wind, windier parts, maybe north, south uh, Europe, um, I think it's very important to have that interconnection that we've got across the EU and making sure that we enhance that um, so that we can take advantage of the fact that uh, we've got those differences between weather patterns in the south and the north of Europe. Naomi, I'd like to bring you on, in on this. And we also have a question from Sabrina Mel. And apologies, my voice is going slightly. Um, in view of the massive annual increase in wind and solar power generation, are problems in the supply chain or shortages to be expected? Yes, uh, if you allow, I just also wanted to, to continue on this point. I mean, I also saw a question on the chat about solar variability, weather dependency. I mean, um, first, I just want to stress that solar is actually uh, very, I mean, now, now with experience, we can really forecast solar and wind generation quite well. Uh, with big data, we can also with uh, with battery storage uh, uh, control a bit more uh, solar PV and wind generation. And again, when when it comes to weather dependency, I'm always wondering: do you also count uh, water dependent generation like coal or or nuclear that will have problems in uh, in heavy uh, in very hot summers to generate when we need to power our AC also. Uh, weather dependency, energy generation problems. So I think we need to take a step back to um, to look at this, uh, these issues. Now, how do we deal with uh, with seasonal storage? I, I completely uh, agree with what has been said. 
uh, before, I uh, just want to reflect that uh, we will we are working on our own uh, 2040 energy system modeling, uh, which will be released at our event uh, the first week of March, the Solar Power Summit. And what we do see is that the, the, the main seasonal storage issues will start to rise post 2030. So uh, by then we'll have an, a number of technologies. I think one technology that's always underestimated is a building level demand response because we'll have massive amount of electricity uh, uh, consumption, EVs, heat pumps that will be uh, digital and, and connected to the, I mean, able to respond to uh, to the to the power grid signals. So, uh, so yeah, by then there will be a, probably a, a, a number of uh, of new technologies that will help us uh, tackle this problem. When it comes to uh, supply chains, uh, no, we don't expect any issues with uh, with the supply chains. Actually, the the solar supply chain is performing quite well. We even have uh, too uh, many products, or we we have quite a lot of product now uh, in Europe, uh, thanks to uh, a globalized uh, a globalized supply chain. Um, what's important is to keep working at uh, developing our own supply chain in Europe, as we do for wind, as we do for batteries. Uh, we have a couple of projects that reopened uh, in Germany, in uh, Italy for modules, and we still have a, a, a very good solar inverter industry. So the device that transforms electricity from DC to AC, that is a very uh, smart industry in the, in the solar system, smart device in the, in the solar system. Um, and in, yeah, and as mentioned before, uh, uh, it will be important to support uh, both of these industries also to ensure that they can deliver efficiency to the, to the power system. Yesterday, we had a uh, political agreement on the Net Zero Industry Act. Uh, so it will be important to see how this is implemented to uh, to provide support while at the same time not slowing down uh, development. Thank you. And also a great little plug there for the Solar Power Summit in case anyone is interested in going to that as well. Uh, so we've heard your views on this, but we also have a question from Gregor, Gregor Kutter. How is electricity or how can electricity demand be covered during Dunkelflutter? I apologize for my German pronunciation there. Does anyone on the panel want to take that question? I guess I was trying to read my point earlier about trying to highlight that that sweet spot of storage that needs to be um that that, that needs to be filled um uh, across a few weeks, a uh, couple of weeks. Um so uh, that's I guess that 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 is one of the questions at the moment. One of the the key tools that we know is available to us that people are working on at the moment is around hydrogen. So taking the electrolysis of the excess power when when it is when you have those windier weeks um, and then put it to be able to then uh, convert that back into electricity um, when when it's not windy and what what you've seen in uh, this week's announcement within Germany to build ten gigawatts of hydrogen ready power plants has got that in mind in itself and that will be the end result of that 10 gigawatts that will be built within Germany to be able to, to, to cope with that. So that's the biggest tool we have at the moment. Um, there's lots more research going on and lots of exciting technologies and it'll just be, it's got, it's got to be a, a, a big focus really on how policymakers can help support those technologies as they come through because um, uh, we've just seen how fast change is happening on the ground and just because we don't have that exact solution today uh, doesn't mean that we won't have it tomorrow. Thank you. Unless anyone else wants to come in or does anyone else want to come in on that? If not, I have another question. I can quickly come in, but I'm very sorry. I have a very demanding cut, which is uh, so part of the panel now. So sorry for that. Uh, Maybe just to, to mention that except of the a combination of solutions and those new technological solutions needed that, that Dave just mentioned, I think uh, for the time being, at least until 2030, uh, we know that some countries use strategic reserve, which is basically uh, putting uh, uh, fossil plants into a regime with very low operating hours, which th this can help as a solution, which is a legal under the EU framework and then also limiting the, the emissions from the power sector. Thank you. Thank you. And we just got to hear from your cat at the end. What would an online webinar be without that? Um, Giovanni, I'd like to come to you next. We have a question from Andrew Smith. What would be your top three tax changes that you want to see? So we've heard a bit about the Energy Taxation Directive, but what other things or 
energy taxation directive as well what would you like to see changed well <clears throat> for example uh, um, what we have seen uh, now in germany with the plan of uh, bringing the electricity tax uh, to a minimum for uh, businesses uh, uh, is is quite quite positive news in my opinion especially when compared to other uh, plans uh, for for industrial policy through through electricity pricing uh, that were thought of uh, before um i think also another one would be really to uh, as i said before uh, phase out uh, all fossil fuel subsidies both uh, explicit and implicit um and uh, uh, then yeah probably also on on vat uh, bringing it down on uh, on electricity while uh while phasing out uh, all the subsidies uh, that were introduced especially during the energy crisis a lot of which uh, uh basically brought to a minimum of VAT for, for natural gas uh, or reduced the uh, excise duties uh, on uh, petrol. Uh, uh, so I think uh, e there, there is ample margin for, for improvement there for a rebalancing of, of taxation across most countries, really. Excellent, thank you. Well, that's about all we have time for, but maybe I'd like to give the, the final word to either Dave or Sarah. Do you have any key point or message that you want to leave our audience with and maybe plug the report a bit more? Okay, I guess there's two things I really want to highlight as I see trends for 2024, and one is that rising electrification, and one is, is the rising number of hours where you are going to get surplus electricity onto the grid. And really there's an overlap between those two, which is that, that we, I don't think we're focusing on enough, which is as we're building up more electric cars to be able to make sure that's being tied back to people charging when that wind and solar is available. It's crazy that during last summer, you've got like people like myself charging electric cars overnight when there's negative electricity prices during the day, like you're using a battery to charge a battery. Not like that doesn't make any sense. There's got to be a better way to do that. Um, and then likewise, as heat pumps are getting integrated and built into people's houses, they're not built with any consideration of how um, of, 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 of trying to build that up when it's windy and sunny and how you would cope and, 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 and use your electricity at that time. So that would be that's the two trends that I see coming through 2024 and a real opportunity, I think, to 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 um, to, to mesh those two together to help accelerate the transition. Thank you. Sarah, do you have a final word that you'd like to leave our audience with? Yeah, sure. I think for me, it's that we saw that uh, great news that attention was turning to these key enablers and, and maybe tackling some of these barriers and coming up with solutions to getting that renewables integration that we need. Um, and so I just want to see for 2024 that, you know, implementation of this is key. It's all very well having targets, but what we've got to make sure is that these targets are implemented and that these barriers are addressed um, and not just at the EU level. But, you know, we've had a lot of mention of, of national energy and climate plans, and it's really fundamental that the member states are assisted and, and do transpose EU legislation and also um, are able to implement the, the wind and solar and the, and the uh, solutions that we need to see. So implementation and tackling barriers, I think that's probably quite a good message as we look to the year ahead. Well, thank you, everyone. That's about all we have time for. Thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their insights. And thank you to our audience for coming along and asking their questions. If this discussion has made you want to find out more about Ember's report, it is available online alongside all the open source data to download and explore. If you have any questions as well, the Ember team would be happy to talk to you. So thank you for joining us and hope you have a great rest of the day.